Square Pulpit Series. It was recorded in the Sanctuary of Times Square Church in Manhattan, New York City. Other tapes are available by writing to World Challenge, P.O. Box 260, Lindale, Texas, 75771, or calling 214-963-8626. None of these messages are copyrighted, and you are welcome to make copies for free distribution to your friends. We should not be moved. Oh, God put us in that number. Psalm 16. Oh, that was powerful. Praise the Lord. Mm. I don't know everybody can sit in their seat with that. Praise the Lord. Glory to Jesus. I want to read uh, just two verses from Psalm 16, verse 7 and 8. I'm reading from King James. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Now, I think in the New American Standard it says, I will not be shaken, and you'll see in just a while that that means the very same thing. I shall not be shaken, I shall not be moved. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, there is no way that the Word can find its mark or change in life without the anointing and the unction of the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, I bow my heart before you. I bow my heart humbly before God. And I ask that you quicken the Word that you placed in my heart. There's nothing can happen in this service tonight. The Word will fall flat without that power and unction of the Holy Ghost. Lord Jesus, you have always given that authority in this pulpit. We thank you for the men that you've called to bring a people in the conformity of the image of the Lord Jesus. Now, Holy Ghost, come upon me. I yield my body as an instrument of righteousness. I yield it, Lord, that you may speak, kick my voice, and make it an oracle of God tonight. And let the word cut, and let it heal, and let it bless and edify, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. We shall not be moved. Now, David has just made a powerful boast in the Lord. I shall not be moved. Now, the Hebrew word that he used is moat, which means to waver, slip, slide, shake, fall, decay, or get off course. Now, to read this properly, David is saying, I shall not waver, or slip, or slide, or shake, or quake, or fall, or decay, or get off my spiritual course. I'm not going to be moved. Now, when I was a boy, <clears throat> we had old-fashioned camp meeting down in Living Waters, Pennsylvania. Camp meeting. In fact, those were uh, very uh, poor days, and the only vacation people had was camp meeting, two weeks of camp meeting. Hundreds and hundreds of people would gather at Cherry Tree, Pennsylvania, Living Waters Campground, and one of the favorite songs, I was just a kid, it was, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water, I'm going to sing it for you. I shall not be moved. And I, it was awesome to see hundreds of people singing that, clap their hands, saying over and over again, I shall not be moved. And it created a steadfastness in that people. Now, not just the song, but the intensity, and they meant it. Nothing will move me from my steadfastness in Jesus Christ. Now, of course, that song uh, has been uh, prostituted by activist groups in past years. They have used this for the civil rights movement. They've used it for the abortion uh, groups. And they are singing this, I shall not be moved, meaning I shall not be moved from my commitment to the cause. It's been a prostituted song. It's also been the song of billionaire uh, Trump, Donald Trump. I shall not be moved. It was the theme song of Iron Man heavyweight boxer Mike Tyson. These men boasted, I shall not be moved, I'm on the top of the world, nobody can touch me, I'll never fall, slip, slide, or waver. <clears throat> the Bible says, the wicked has said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in trouble. He said in his heart, God's forgotten me, he hideth his face, he'll never see it. He'll never see it. Cheat on your wife, he'll never see it. Do what you please, he'll never see it. That's the reason they believe that uh, they shall never be moved. I, I remember years ago, some of you here remember the Beatles. Now, you know, it's amazing how 
quickly the world loses its uh, appeal. A lot of kids don't even know who the Beatles are. They think they're little bugs. <laughs> Down at uh, Epcot Center last week, when my wife and I were on vacation, there's a uh, thing there with uh, Michael Jackson. He, he, he has a 3D movie. And I saw the people lining up, and I looked kids, who's Michael Jackson? Oh, wait, who's Michael Jackson? The, the popularity is gone. They saw it shall never be moved, and in just a few years, they moved and they fall and they go on. But the Beatles boasted, uh, I remember the, that very boast, I remember reading it and hearing it on the, the radio. One of the Beatles said, we are more popular than Jesus Christ, we will outlive him. One punch... And the mighty Iron Man Tyson was on the canvas. One, one bullet, and down went John Lennon. One seductress, and the billionaire's empire of Trump is beginning to unravel. One seductress. They, these boasted, I shall never be moved, I'll never be in trouble, I'll never slide, I'll never fall. But God said, surely you did set them in slippery places. Thou casteth them down into destruction, and in a moment they fell. In a moment, they fell. Now, I believe we're living in the days right now that Paul the Apostle prophesied about. He said that the coming of the Lord, before he comes, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Now, you know as well as I do that all sides, right now there's an apostasy, there's a falling away. And the scripture said Jesus will not come until this great falling away takes place. You see it right now in the ministry. We have lived for the past two years of seeing minister after minister, famous, falling. We've seen it on a lesser scale among churches everywhere. We, we just got a uh, notice this morning of a church. Uh, the deacons waited on the pastor to have him removed. They asked the rest of the deacons to go to the pastor and ask him to resign because they caught him coming out of an R-rated movie. And others had seen him at a tape, a uh, place where they sell tapes, uh, checking out a whole bunch of R-rated tapes. Very evident that the man was addicted to pornography. And they asked the, they went to the pastor, three of them went to the pastor. Pastor blew up, threw them out of the church, and he continues there going on. Well, one day that will be exposed because God's exposing all of that kind of garbage in the church. He's exposing it in the pew. He's exposing it everywhere. There is a great a uh, falling, a great idolatry, a great prostitution of the gospel today. But my message tonight is not about the falling away. My message tonight about is about God's intention to have a people in these last days who will not fall, slip or slide or waver, decay, or get off course. God is going to have that people, and He's in the process of putting that body together right now. Now, Suffice to say, he's always had that body. He had it in the New Testament church. He's had it all through history. But I believe in this climatic day, in the last day before Jesus comes, it, it, it's the gathering together of all things. This is the capstone. He's going to have a capstone remnant, pure and righteous and steadfast, and every demon can be spit out of hell and they're not going to fall. Every kind of wickedness can be poured out of baptism of more filth and degradation, and they will not be moved. They're going to be strong and steadfast, as strong as any generation has ever produced by the Holy Ghost. Here's the promise God has made to them. A thousand shall fall at your side. Ten thousand at your right hand. But it shall not come nigh to you. Hallelujah. Now let me talk about this matter of not being moved in these last days. I'm going to say it clearly. God is getting ready of people who will not be moved in these last days, no matter what kind of trouble, no matter what kind of destruction is coming. The scripture says, even though the earth be removed, and the mountains will be carried into the sea. Now I want you to go with me to Psalms 46. We're going to go a lot of places in the Psalms tonight. God's going to bless us right out of our boots in Psalms. If you don't have boots, we'll take shoes. Psalms 46, verses 1 to 5. Beloved, God's going to send a revival of steadfastness. A revival of steadfastness upon a people who are part of this city of God that he's putting together. First five verses. God is our refuge and strength, 
if that person had been troubled, therefore will not we feel though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. Praise God. Now, I want you to look at the condition that's going to be prevalent when God raises up these people, and, and it's all outlined in this, this very chapter. First of all, the scripture talks about waters. In fact, go on just a little bit. Verse 6. The heathen waged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. Now, what's happening right now? Look at me, please. If you stop for just a moment and think of the conditions in the world right now, you'll find them described right here now. You'll find them described. Paul, or rather David, is pointing to a time in history, a time in which we live right now. The conditions that are prevalent right now, you can go get a New York Times tonight, and you'll read it just as David prophesied it here. It's all very clear. The Lord of hosts is, uh, the, the heathen raids, the kingdoms were moved. What kind of kingdoms are being moved right now? Russia, all the eastern bloc countries. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Verse 8, come behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he is making in the earth. Makes wars to cease into the end of the earth. He breaks the bow. That means he's going to break all the armies of the world. He's going to make them powerless in light of his glory. He's going to cut the spear in sunder. He's going to burn the chariot in the fire. Did you get a picture of the Russians hightailing it out of Afghanistan? They couldn't wait to get out. The whole Russian army moving out. Total defeat, giving up on Afghanistan. Even now, the Russian army that was once so powerful, once so mighty, is now in shambles. Russia is on the brink of financial bankruptcy. What happened? God suddenly spoke the word. We're living in that time right now. He said he's going to break the bow, cut the spear in sunder, burn the chariots in the fire. He said, the heathen will rage, the kingdoms will fall, the governments will melt at the sound of his voice. He said, the mountains will shake, the waters are going to roar and be troubled. The waters speak of people, as Bob mentioned this morning. They're going to roar, there's going to be a wave uh, after wave coming and pounding the shore. The troubled waters. Now, the psalmist is speaking of the same day that Jesus foretold about. Didn't Jesus say the day is coming? when there be such horrible things coming on the earth, that men's hearts will fail them for fear, beholding those things that are coming to pass. Oh, brother, sister, it's happening right now, that hearts of men are failing them for fear all across the world. Now, would you stop with me for just a moment and think of what we have witnessed in the past two years alone. Do you remember the upheaval in China, the massacre in Beijing, in Tiananmen Square? Hundreds and thousands of young people gathered and then the machine guns were opened on those young people. That's been in the past two years. We've seen the fall of the Iron Curtain. Who could have ever believed when we started this year that we would look back and see in just such a short time the, the bulldozers are there right now bulldozing down that wall. Who would ever thought that in just a few months both Germanys would come together and that beast that was wounded, that head that was wounded is being healed again. That beast is rising again. It's going to be the heart of that new revived Roman Empire. Who could have ever believed that Russia would rush to the peace table to sign almost every affidavit, every peace proposal, reduction of troops, everything that our representative Baker laid on the table, they signed on the dot. There's an urgency in Russia. They need our dollars. Isn't it amazing that America is going to have to bail out the communists? And we're so dumb and so stupid, we'll do it. 
Who would have ever believed that just a year ago in Romania, a heartless, bloody dictator was shaking his fist at the world, and now he's underground. Who would ever believe that we would have the leaders of Poland and Czechoslovakia standing before our Congress saying the very same thing that the prophet David, and David was a prophet, is saying right here. They, they said, our nation is in shambles, asking America to bail them out. Who could have ever believed it? Well, we have in Russia right now, whole states trying to secede from that union. What would you think of Texas trying to secede from the United States? And that's the very thing they have. Those states are trying to secede from that union. Think of Panama, the war that we've just concluded. Noyega's in jail. Think of South Africa and the turmoil there. All over the world, there's not a spot, there's not a place that is not in perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Trouble in Lithuania, Armenia, East and West Germany, Afghanistan, and in America. Thousands of our SNLs have gone bankrupt. It's going to cost, they estimate now, 250 to 300 billion dollars to bail out those banks, and the biggest are still going down. Drexel Lambert, who just recently was the biggest junk bond house in America, goes down. Federated goes down. And now, all the major department stores in New York, Saks, Bloomingdale, all the other major department stores are for sale. They're on the market, bargain sale prices. Nobody seems to want to buy them. Can you imagine? You know, at Christmas time, if you would have gone into Bloomingdale's and seen all the activity and, and everything looked so uh, bright, and now that is on the market, they're just hanging on the brink of bankruptcy. Can you believe that? Even Macy's is in trouble. Here we are in this city all these years, these many, many uh, decades now. Many of these stores, the heart to jewel in this city, now it's all tarnished. Look at Wall Street, 35,000 people have been laid off in just two years now. New York City bonds have been downgraded once again, the second time now this year, or, or the last year. They're facing a billion dollar shortfall this next year. Massachusetts is about to go bankrupt. New York and New Jersey face multi-billion dollar shortages in their budgets, and they're still spending like broken sailors. Oh, how precise God's word is. The waters will roar and be troubled. How precise the word of God is. The brother, sister, in the midst of all of this shaking, in the midst of all this turmoil, David gives us a picture prophetically of a people that are sitting beside a still stream while the waves all around them are rolling. There's a city of God. It's a people holy and sanctified. And there's a river running right through them. And they're sitting there drinking from that river. And their hearts are glad. They're unmovable. Everything is shaken around them. And they stand unmovable and shaken. Read it again with me. Verse 3. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Now that's the scene all around us. But look in the house of God. There is a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High God. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. And God shall help her. And that right early. Hallelujah. Would you follow me very closely now? God is in the midst of this people. Now, God himself is describing a people who are not going to be moved. She, speaking of his church, this last day holy remnant, shall not be moved. This people among whom I will dwell, they will drink from the river of my presence, and they will not slip, they will not slide, they will not get off course. I'm going to hold them. Hallelujah. Now, brother, Sister God has given us some ironclad promises to keep a certain people from falling in the last days. Why don't you go to Psalm 121? Psalm 121. Do you love the word? Psalm 121. I'm going to read the whole chapter, all eight verses. 
had you scared there for just a moment. Psalm 121. You got to mark these chapters. Boy, if you ever get discouraged and you want to know what God's about to do, keep a record of these scriptures I'm giving you tonight. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which hath made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy, what? The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon the right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forward, even forever. Praise his name. The Lord is thy keeper. Now, what that means, he's your guard. And it, in the Hebrew, it suggests a wall of thorns. He said, I'm going to be a wall of fire around you, but as far as the enemy, I'm going to be a wall of thorns outside that wall of fire. I see two walls. I see first a wall of thorns. If the devil wants to get near the fire, first of all, he's going to get hurt. Even before he gets to the fire. He said, I'm going to be your guard. I'm going to be your keeper. I wonder, how many in the balcony here, on the main floor, hearing me tonight, are willing to step out by faith and really receive what God is promising us tonight? I'm going to read it again. 121, verse 7 and 8. Look at it. Don't read it unless you're ready to accept it. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. You don't have to be afraid that you're going to slip and slide and fall and waver. Now we're going to have, we're going to show the qualifications for this in just a few moments. So don't, don't get too happy about it until you see if you meet the qualifications. But are you ready by faith to say, this is what I want? The Lord preserve thee from all of you, so preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out, thy coming in from this time forward and even forevermore. I'm going to do it through time and eternity. I'm going to protect every step. I'm going to lead you every way. He said, I'm going to even lead you right through eternity. Praise God. He's saying, Lord... Uh, 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 wait, let me, get, let me give you another. Don't turn it, but Psalm 66, 8 and 9, if you want to mark it and go home and read it. David said, Oh, bless our God, ye people, and make the voice and, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, who holdeth our soul in life and suffereth not our feet to be moved. Look at me, please. David said, Through all my trials, through all my testing, through all my dry spells, through all the things I've been through, Lord, you had my soul in life. You had my soul in life. You didn't let death come to me. You didn't let my spirit die. I may not have been red hot. I may not have been where I should have been, but there's something in me you saw, dear Lord. And you had my soul in life. You didn't let my feet slip. You didn't let me be moved. You held me. And some of you sitting here right now, you know what David's talking about. You know exactly what he's talking about because you've been tested. The devil tried to tear your soul apart. He tried to bring you down to degradation. He tried to tell you you'll never make it. He tried to tell you you're going to blow it all. That sin is going to overwhelm you. That your habits are going to possess you and bring you down. That you'll never be clean. You'll never be sanctified through all the testing, through all the lies of the devil. The Lord had your soul in life. He said, praise the Lord, let all the people here, through my trials and tests, you held my soul steady. And here you sit in this church tonight, yearning for Jesus more than you've ever yearned. you made the devil madder than you've ever made him. And it was all God's doing. He held you in life. Oh, thank God. I look back and I thank him for holding me in life. He didn't let death overwhelm me. Well, who are these people that are going to be immovable? Who are these? What qualifications? Why is it that God is going to protect them? Now, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to be immovable in these last days. There's going to be many of them that are lost. I, I, I think of some of these people in the headlines now and that are cheating and living in sin and doing all these crazy things. And then uh, I, I read about the churches they attend. And I, I get to thinking, Lord, what are they hearing? 
Uh, is the preacher afraid to stand up and preach the gospel for fear that someone that's got a lot of money or prestige will not come back again? Or I dread the thought of having to stand before the judgment day and answer for not preaching truth to people. When I prepare a word, I know it's the same with all these pastors. I don't, I don't even stop to think of who it might hurt. I want it to hurt me first. We're not out to hurt people, out to conform people to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. But to do that, you've got to do a lot of cutting and pounding. If the sword of the Lord has to go right through to the poison. Hallelujah. Who are these immovable ones and what qualified them to be kept? What's going to qualify this people? Let's go to, back to Psalm 16.8. Back to Psalm 16.8. Now, you can't say, now listen closely, you can't say, I shall not be moved until you can say with David, I have set the Lord always before me. Look at it in verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Now, uh, did you mark that? All right, look this way, please. This is one of the most important statements in all of God's Word. It's the secret of being steadfast and immovable in these troubled times. There's something David did. God didn't do it, David did it. It was a discipline. We have a lot of people just sitting around waiting for God to reveal himself. God preached about Jesus passing this way. And he made it clear he's passing that way so you reach out and touch him. He wanted to draw out of us. He wanted to draw out of us a desire. A will. And there has to be a will involved. David said, I have set my, the Lord always before me. This is something David did. He said, I'll set the Lord over before my face. David, and, and that word that is used there, set, is the only place in the Bible it is used in this connotation. The word means adjust. The only place in the Bible. The, that particular word set is used in the Hebrew connotation of adjustment. And what David's saying, I've adjusted my lifestyle, I've adjusted my whole life, so that every waking hour, and I've disciplined myself to do this, it just didn't happen. I've disciplined my life and my spirit, my eyes, to have Jesus ever before my face. You can't say, I will not be moved, until you can say, I have set the Lord always before my face. He said, what he's really saying, I will not do anything. You, you know, we say, without Christ I can do nothing. Well, it's more than that. Because you see, there are, are many who believe that, but David goes a step further. It's not only, Lord... I can't do anything without you, but he could say, Lord, I know I can do anything with you because you've given me the strength. But David's saying something even deeper. He's saying, Lord, I'll not do anything outside of the gaze of your eyes. I'll never do anything in secret. I'll never do anything to grieve you. I'm going to do everything. I'm going to act and I'm going to live and I'm going to think. In my home, in my business, in my job, everything. Jesus, I want to do it within the reach of your arm, the reach of your eyes. I want to be so close to you, I want to set you right there before my face. So that a thousand times a day, no matter where I look, my eyes are fixed on you. They always come back to you. And I press Christ. I press Jesus onto every activity, into everything I do. I press Jesus into that picture. I set him before my eyes. And when you do that, you begin to see the foolishness of this world. You begin to see the shortness of time. You begin to see everything in a different picture. You begin to say, Lord, you no longer say, Lord, how does this benefit me? How does it benefit just my family? But Lord, how does this benefit you? How does this fit into your eternal purpose? 
How does this fit in? Because you see, God has a plan. Everything is flowing toward a plan. Everything God does on earth is flowing toward that moment when He'll be glorified. And He's bringing a body, He's bringing a church into that unity, into that flow. And brother, sister, everything we do is to fit into that flow of the eternal purpose of God in Jesus Christ. The end of side one. You may now turn the tape over to side two. That means that you, no matter what your job is, it's not just for preachers who are full time in the ministry. It's for everyone hearing my voice. You're to be so far gone in Jesus. You're supposed to go so far out in Jesus you can't come back. You're to trip out on Jesus so you can't come back. So far out in Him, you don't set your face on anything else. When people set their face on the ministry, they set their face on their job, they set their face on their family, they set their face on everything but Jesus, and that's why they're disappointed. That's why they're up and down and hot and cold. They have not fixed their gaze. When I woke up this morning, First thing when I get up now, David, God's been pressing it. First thing I get up, I begin to minister to Him. I begin to discipline myself and say, Jesus, not just a half an hour this morning. And even though David said I pray in the evening, morning at noon, David said, I have a fixed position. My mind is going out. I want my mind stamped. And brother, sister, that's what it's going to take in these last days. It's going to be a people who have so fixed their eyes on Jesus that any distraction... Now, you can still do your business and you do a better job, but filter it all through Him. He said, Lord, I want more than your power, more than your strength. I want to see that everything I do flows into your eternal plan. I want to see what I'm doing through your eyes. How does this bless you in the kingdom of God? And David's cry is, I've got to have him at my right hand at all times. I've got to have him within reach. I don't want to have to get down on my knees and pray for half an hour to touch the fire. I don't want to have to make him a bunch of promises. I don't want to have to be good for a week before I merit something from him. I want him at my right hand, available all the time. I want to just talk to him. Jesus, here's what the situation is. I don't want to have to work myself up into his presence. I want him at my right hand. And he said, because he's at my right hand, I'll never fall. Because I stay within reach. David came to that place the hard way. There's a time... He'd been complacent. He got spiritually lazy and careless. How easy it is to become careless. Do you know that the greatest sin I think on earth is not drugs, alcohol, and all these things we talk about. The greatest sin on earth is contentment without God. Contentment without God. And that's the sin of Christians, how contented they can be and not grow. How contented they can be in some past experience. And how, care, how easy and how quickly become careless before the Lord. I've seen that that happen in my ministry. I went through five years of carelessness where I almost lost the touch of God and I almost lost my soul. It's under the grace of God and that's why I feel this intensity in my heart. In the past month or so, there's such an intensity in my heart to measure everything according to His divine purpose and will. And not how it fits into my ministry. Not how it blesses me or even the church, but how it fits into His cause. But David had been blessed of the Lord. David could say, you made my mountain stand tall. He said, you made my mountain stand strong. You blessed me. You favored me. And he acknowledged the favor of God. In fact, if you just slip over to Psalms 30... Verse 6, and in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Now, David, in fact, the Hebrew has a very bad connotation on this. He said, there was a time God blessed me and I got careless. In my castle, I began to boast. I can't fall. 
I know the Lord. And he said, in my carelessness, in my prosperity, and folks, the danger of blessings, the danger of blessings is this very thing. Jerusalem, or Jerusalem, Israel has grown fat and prosperous and has forgotten her God. And the tendency with all of us is that when God begins to favor us and He makes our mountain to stand strong, there's a tendency to become careless. And then we become boastful. And we say, I'll never be moved. I'll never be shaken. Do you see it there? Take heed, the scripture said, when you think you stand as you fall. But that has to do only with a careless Christian. Doesn't talk, that doesn't mean the Christian is walking in his, his power. Verse 7, Lord... By thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. But then look at David, he has to confess, even though he's under the favor of God, his mountain stands strong, something's happened to him. He's boasted, I cannot fall, he's walking in the flesh now. And listen to what he says, Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. Look at me please, listen. Carelessness in David brought about a spirit of adultery. Murder, lying, the judgment of God on his life. But it resulted in something, I think, worse than that. And that was an emptiness, the hiding of God's face. The sense of having lost something that he had with the Lord. The, the sense that his whole being was shaken. And he loses that self-confidence. I don't have any confidence in my flesh. Any more than Paul the Apostle did. Brother, sister, if I don't walk close to Jesus, if you don't walk close to Jesus, we'll never make it. We can't make it in our own strength. And don't dare boast in your blessing and your prosperity because God has favored you that you can go on carelessly. No! Oh, we have so many careless saints today. God's blessed them. And you, I'll tell you, the easiest place you can become careless is right here at Times Square Church. You can become careless about the things of God. There was a time you couldn't wait to get uh, a sermon tape. You, you, you would hear a message and then you get tapes out there and go home and listen to it again. You took tapes to work and everything else. And now uh, you, 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 you don't do that. Or you give them to friends. But you see, the things, just a little bit of carelessness is slipping in. I'm not talking about the tapes itself. But even coming to the house of God with that excitement, with that zeal. That hunger, that thirst, that openness, that humility, that brokenness before the Lord. And David said, listen to it, you hid your face. I was troubled. And all that troubling inside. That, but David said, I cried to the Lord. When that troubling came to my heart, and when I felt that God was hiding his face from me for a season, I cried to the Lord. Here it is, verse 8, I cried to the Lord, and unto the Lord I made my supplication. Well, that's when David could say, I shall not be moved because I've set his face always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Now, let me give you another qualification for this immovable company. I want you to go to Psalm 62. Psalm 62. Saints, I consider Psalm 62 one of the greatest chapters in all the book of so the, all the Psalms, Psalm 62, 91 is great. Many of them are powerful, but 62 really blesses my heart. I think you ought to read that every week. Mark, Psalm 62, a powerful, powerful chapter. Here's the next qualification. Are you ready? This immovable company can testify Jesus alone is enough. Can I repeat that? Jesus alone is enough. Verse 1, chapter 62. Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Verse 6. And King James says, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Or I shall not be shaken. I want you to look at verse 5. Verse 5. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. Look at me, please. 
Here's where David came. And all this is where, I, if, if I have any goal in my life, if there's one thing I want the Holy Ghost to do for me, I want it to bring me to this place. Because this is the antidote against all disappointment and despair, especially among Christian workers. Here's the antidote to keep despair, discouragement out of your heart. My expectation is from Him. David expected absolutely nothing anymore from the world. He didn't look for any fulfillment, any joy, any blessing from the world. He said, everything I expect now to bring me fulfillment, everything that's going to be real in my life from now on, I expect nothing from anybody but Him. He alone is my life. He alone is all I need. That didn't mean he would neglect his family. No, he would enjoy everything about him. But he said, I don't expect it to make me happy. I don't expect anything. I do not even my ministry to make me happy. All my expectation is from him. Everything I expect to receive that will bring me meaning to my life. All my joy. All my meaning for being. All my purpose for being. It's going to come directly from me. He alone is all I need. Now that's, that's heavy because, you see, for David, his best friend, who ate bread at his own table, betrayed him. His own son drove him from his throne. His wife, Micah, mocked him. His high counselor committed treason against him with Absalom. His children brought him down to grief, caused him to weep for days. The high priest, Abiathar, he so loved, Joined in rebellion with his son Adonijah. Here's a man who had seen everything around him failing. But he came to this. Whom have I in heaven now but thee? And there's none upon earth that I desire beside thee. God now has become my portion. The Lord has become my portion in life. What is it that's bothering you tonight? What is it that's troubling your heart? Why are you cast down? Why are you discouraged? You know why? Because you've not come to that place yet where all your expectation comes from Jesus alone. You see, I had a telephone call two weeks ago from a southern city. A pastor who had quite a a uh, number of years of experience. And the Lord recently, through books and our newsletters and others, brought him to a ministry of repentance. He began to preach repentance and holiness in his church. They, were, they used to run probably three, four hundred people, and he said, well, they, I'm losing people left and right. They don't want to hear it. There's such a carelessness. He said, my heart's broken. I feel like I've failed. And you see, the only thing I could tell a man like that is then, brother, the reason you're so down and discouraged you're expecting something from this world, yet you're expecting something from your ministry to bring you joy and fulfillment. And you see, that doesn't work unless you see the other side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is this. David said, verse 8, Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour at your heart before Him. And the word is to gush it out. Spill it. You see, I, I, I am bothered, I am troubled. Then check out and see where you're looking for fulfillment. I used to get almost all my fulfillment out of my ministry. You see, look, I even called it my ministry. That's how, how selfish it is. If the altars were filled in my crusades, I'd go home and I'd feel great. And my wife could live with me. I, 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 I would uh, be just as kind and gentle, but I'll tell you, watch out. If I didn't see the altars filled and uh, it was a dead meeting and something went wrong, and I, I'd go home and go in the room and sulk. My wife knew better than to come in to that room sometimes. That's how bad it was. Even when I pastored, when I was a young man looking for that fulfillment, 
What is it you're looking for to fulfill you? What is it that you're looking for? Because the one thing you think that you want, if I just get this, I'll be fulfilled. You get it and it doesn't fulfill you. And so what you do, you put a stake out in the future and you, you throw a lasso out there and you get the rope on it and you pull yourself up to that point. You say, I get there, I've made it. You get there and it's up. So you take the stake a little further and pull yourself up there. And you keep trying to climb that mountain when you get up there and look it all over you say, all is vanity. All is vanity. Did you see the paper today? Well, of course you didn't. Uh, I just, uh, at the restaurant, uh, today eating lunch, I looked at the Daily News, and there was an article there by a friend of Donald Trump, a very dear friend, and he said Donald Trump has a yacht, a very expensive yacht, and he has all of this money, he said, but he's very unhappy. He's looking for some peace of mind and happiness. He's miserable. Uh, Malcolm Ford's just died, multi-millionaire, the one that threw those multi-million dollar parties, the one who just introduced a new uh, magazine called Egg, isn't it, E-G-G? And he said it, it, it's a magazine for fun people who know how to live right, to live good. Isn't it amazing he dies the week the magazine comes out? I, I, I said sadly. It's, it's not really funny. It, it's sad, isn't it? It's ironic. The, 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 the poor man is dead and gone, the fun man, the pleasure man. You see, nothing satisfies these people. They're, they're miserable. They cry themselves to sleep. There's no joy. I, I believe they can look at that yacht and say, oh, it's a piece of junk. $35 million piece of junk. I bet their time, I wish it would sink. Really? We don't know. If you only knew, if you could only talk. I've talked to many people with great wealth who didn't know Jesus. And it didn't bring any joy. It didn't bring any peace. It brought nothing but sadness and sorrow. But you see, there's nothing in this world to meet that need. I ask you, in your life, is Jesus enough? Have you come to that place? If you lost everything, he's enough. That you would be happy. That there would be joy. You'd be fulfilled. I have to come to that place that where if, if the, the economy collapsed and there, were no, there was no other place to preach except out on the street. There was nothing I could put out and show tangibly. There's nothing that I could show. Here's what I'm doing for God. And it's all gone. There's nothing you can do but turn to Jesus. Well, He alone is everything. And that's where He's going to bring us, folks. Where Jesus alone, David said, He is all I need. He alone, He is my rock. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He's my defense. I shall not be moved. Hallelujah. Pour out your hearts before Him. David said, I pour out my soul in Him. There's never been a time that I was hurting that I didn't find healing when I just went in the secret closet and shut the door and cried it all out. Whatever you've got on you right now, you can go to Jesus and lay it down. You can come out saying, Jesus is enough. Hallelujah. Jesus is enough. Now, I've saved the best part for the last. The final qualification. Now, there are many others, but I'm only going over these three. This is the last one. Hallelujah. Uh, go with me to... Verse 6. 62 verse 6. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. What's it say in New American Standard? He's strong. Same thing. Strong all defense. I shall not be shaken or I shall not be moved. Now folks, listen closely. This word defense in Hebrew is very powerful. You know what it means? Now, Listen good. Listen in the heart. What he's saying, the Lord is my defense. That word in Hebrew is, as it was given, as it was given by this prophet, it means high, lofty, safe, strong, inaccessible refuge or hiding place. An inaccessible hiding place. A place the devil can't reach. He is my high Lofty, safe, strong, inaccessible refuge and hiding place. 
That's what he has become to me. In Song of Solomon, don't turn there, Song of Solomon 2.14. The Lord, speaking of his bride, O oh my dove, that are in the cliffs of the rock, in the secret places of the steep, let me see thy countenance. Where, where did the Lord go to talk to his bride? O oh my dove, thou art in the cliffs of the rock, in the secret places of the steeps. Let me see thy countenance. He said, I've got a bride, and this is what he's going to do in these last days. He, those who set their face, set the Lord before their face, those who have made Jesus enough in their life, needing nothing else. Oh, yes, they have family and joy that, but I mean, he's become the very meaning of their life. Then he says, I'm going to take you, my bride. And I'm going to just take you up like a wing, like an eagle on my wings. And I'm going to take you up in the cleft of the rock, and there's a hiding place there. I've got a pavilion. I've got a tent up there. I've got a place where I'm going to hide you. The devil can't reach you. And you're going to be hidden there. Psalms 96, 14 says, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I'll set him up on high. David said, He's my high tower. All through the scripture, God speaks about hiding of the last day people. He's got to hide us. And more than that, the devil, God says, When the devil comes at you, I'm going to laugh and mock at him at his puny ways of trying to reach you. I'm going to mock at him. I'm going to laugh at him because he doesn't know where I've got you. Well, you don't believe that, I'm going to prove it to you. Go to, to uh, Psalms 59. Just go back left a page. 59, verse 8 and 9. But thou, O Lord, shall laugh at them, every demon on hell, all the enemy that comes against us. Thou, O Lord, shall laugh at them, Thou shalt have all the heathen in derision. You'll mock them, in other words. Because of his strength will I wait upon thee, for God is my defense. God has hidden me away. And when the enemy comes to find me, the Lord said, I'll mock at your enemies. I'll laugh at them. I'll hold them in derision. Because they can't touch this people. Listen, the day has to come where you and I realize that we are really in that place that Paul said we are, seated with Christ in a heavenly place. Jesus becomes our hiding place. Hallelujah. When the enemy comes in like a flood, and by the way, when he says, uh, you'll not fall, you're not going to fall from that nest that's hidden up in that cleft of the rock. That's a steep fall. He said, you're not going to fall. I'm going to hold you in the palm of my hand. Glory be to God. Because he set his love upon me, I'll set him on high and I'll keep him. I want you to go finally to Psalms 27. I'm going to give you one last scripture. Psalm 27. You still don't believe me? Verse 5. Let's start with verse 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Behold the beauty of the Lord and the choir of his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. Where, what pavilion? Up in the cleft of the rock, inaccessible to the devil. Hallelujah. He shall hide me, he shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer this tabernacle. Sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy upon me and answer me. Glory be to God. He's got his church hidden away in the palm of his hand. Praise the Lord. Now, I, want to, I said I was only going to give you that. I want to give you one more. 142. Chapter, I'm going to read the whole chapter again. All seven verses, 142. you know why this was written? David wrote that when he's hiding in a cave. The enemy's coming. He's up in his high hidden cave. David has the enemy coming all sight. Look what he said. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. 
when my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I have walked, have they privately laid a snare for me. I looked on my right, and behold, there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. But I cried unto the Lord, O oh Lord, I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of living. And come to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, thou shalt deal bountifully with me. You will bless me, Lord, and you'll hide me in your secret. Stand with me, please. Stand with me, please. Shall we stand? Lord Jesus, we love you tonight because you become our all in all. You're going to have a people out of Times Square Church that you've got hidden away. They shall not fall. They shall not be moved. Lord, they're going to take roots, roots deep down in you. They're going to set you before their face. Always. You will be their strength at their right hand and they shall not be moved. Like a tree planted by the waters, they shall not be moved. I'm telling you now, saints, the devil's a liar. He's lied to some of you and tell you you're going to fall. You're not going to make it. You know, you stand here right now, let faith rise in your heart, and say, I wouldn't be here tonight if it weren't for the Holy Ghost working in my heart. God's working in my life. Hallelujah. You think you'd have come out in a night like this if God wasn't doing something for you? <laughs> you go out there, a uh, 20 below zero wind chill factor blown in your face and you enjoy it. And say, oh God, you did a work in my heart tonight. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. You know, the Lord told me to quit worrying about you. Uh, we pastors, sometimes we keep saying, Lord, is, is she going to make it? Is he going to make it? The Lord said, I'm their keeper. I'm your keeper. I'm your guard. I shall fear no evil. Don't be afraid. We're not afraid of the devil. I'm telling you, if every mountain's cast into the sea, Everything around us is shaking. There's a stream, the river of God that flows with peace. He said, you'll drink and be glad. You'll drink and be glad. Hallelujah. I'm so happy what God's doing in this church. I'm so happy what God's doing in so many of you. All of us as pastors, we rejoice. That's the greatest joy we have. Better than uh, anything else. We, Bob talked about dining. We dine on that. We live on that. That's our life. That's what Paul said, to, to, to see you grow that living epistle, becoming a living epistle. He said, that's my joy and my strength. Hallelujah. But many of you tonight need to shake off those fears. You need to take a stand of faith. Don't let the devil tell you anymore. Don't listen to him. Stand up by faith and say, Lord... I'm going to discipline my heart. I'm going to put you right there first. I'm the most in everything I do. You're everything I need. That's all I want, Jesus. I want you. Are you staying here wanting him? Amen. You're longing for him? Amen. You can't make that happen in you. It's not natural to the natural man to want him. Amen. Ask anybody out in the street. Go up and ask them they want Jesus. <laughs> ask the people, you want Jesus? Oh, I'm okay. Don't talk to Jesus about me. What you're doing tonight is natural. It's unnatural. It's the Holy Ghost. He put that one tail in you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Think about it. Where did it come from? God, the Spirit of God dropped it into your heart. Hallelujah. You would have been long gone. You would have been gone. You would have fallen. But you haven't, you're here tonight because the Holy Ghost has held you in strength and life. Here you are, you want Him tonight more than ever. If you're here, balcony, the main floor. We, we don't want to just pack this place with people. 
We just want those to come up here tonight that have either been cold or you're drifting or the enemy's tried to destroy you or lie to you. You say, Brother David, I'd, I'd like to have that freedom tonight. Step out of your seat. Balcony, go to any stairs on both sides. Come down any aisle. We're going to pray for you. We're going to believe God to set you free and give you a faith like you've never had in your lifetime. God baptize you with a spirit of joy and gladness and faith. Let you stand up against all the onslaught of the enemy tonight. This is the conclusion of the tape.